Good morning, everyone. I'm Cameron Roach, Commissioning Editor for Sky Drama and Chair of the Drama Committee of this year's Television Festival. It's a real privilege to introduce this session, um, the Marvel Television Game Changer session, a conversation between Karim Zraik, Senior Vice President of Original Programming at Marvel Television, and Director S.J. Clarkson. Karim oversees development and production of Marvel's live-action television slate and is working on some Marvel projects at ABC Studios, including the highly anticipated new series Marvel's Inhumans, launching next week on IMAX globally, ahead of its TV release, which is a global first for television. He's also overseen Marvel's Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., as well as the upcoming Marvel's Cloak and Dagger, Runaways, and New Warriors. A game changer herself, SJ is one of the most prolific directors working in television today, both here and in the US. Her credits include Life on Mars, Vinyl, Smash, Orange is the New Black, Dexter, and she is in currently in post-production on the forthcoming David Hare project, Collateral, for the BBC, starring Kerry Mulligan, John Sim, and Billy Piper. But most notably for today's discussion, she directed and executive produced the first two episodes of Marvel's Defenders, which launched last week on Netflix. It's a huge acclaim, I think, if everyone in the room has seen it. And, of course, the first two episodes of Marvel's brilliant Jessica Jones as well. So thank you for that. So finally, it is my job as the policeman to just highlight that you'll be seeing, you've seen signs up there as you came in, but um, Karim has um, generously brought some exclusive footage today to share with us. So can we have no social media activity in the room, no recording? Um, otherwise, the stewards will be on you in a flash. But thank you so much for attending. Thank you both for this session. We really look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cameron. On behalf of Karim and myself, welcome. Thank you. We're excited to be here. <laughs> Very isn't it? I, we usually get to see each other in pre-production at yep. crazy time, and this is actually quite nice. You're usually just, yelling at me. Yeah. Oh, you're <laughs> yelling at me or vice versa or something like that. But um, well, anyway, it's really exciting to be here in Edinburgh. Thank you for hosting this. And I guess, what are we here to talk about? Well, whether you love or loathe the superhero genre, you can't deny its success over the past decade. It started in cinema with big budget, star-studded blockbusters, and more recently with Marvel Television, who over the past five years, yeah, five four, years, yeah, four, four or five years, have changed the game completely by making its franchise the biggest franchise in television in the world. Uh, so Marvel, you're sitting on some phenomenal IP, but that doesn't necessarily translate into great phenomenal TV. So how do you do it? How do you go from comic book to screen? How do you maintain quality control across such a vast slate? You have a vast slate. How many? Uh, we have currently 14 shows in sort of various stages of production. 14 shows. Production, yeah. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> and uh, how do you manage that, which is what we're going to talk about. And also, you're not only across, you know, ABC, which we've already talked about, various platforms, cable networks, streaming, and obviously soon just discussed IMAX, which is very exciting. So we'll also be getting this exclu exclusive previews, which we've talked about. Um, but first of all, where to begin, really? <laughs> Probably with you. Okay. I actually don't know this about you. So, yeah. what was your journey into Marvel TV? Just to put everything into context, because yeah, uh, from the beginning, I, I was uh, I was born in Lebanon, and uh, my family moved uh, to California when I was five. So, uh, not really. I didn't grow up with a television background. It was sort of learning to speak English, watching Sesame Street, sitting with my grandparents, watching Three Stooges, just because we couldn't, I couldn't understand a word they were saying, and it was all visual. And that sort of visual style of storytelling is sort of what affected me. And when it got time to, to go to university, I went to my parents and said, I'd like to go to film school. Their eyes rolled to the back of their heads. Um, and uh, it was after film school, I, I came out of film school thinking I wanted to be a director. Uh, and it was then where I learned about development, and that was something that they didn't teach you at, at university. Um, reading a script, communicating your notes to a writer or a director, uh, and I was fascinated with that, and, and ironically, through a weird twist of, of events, I've been at Disney for 25 years, almost 25 years. Um, I started at Hollywood Pictures, which at the time, uh, it was one of three movie studios uh, for Disney. It was uh, Hollywood Pictures, Touchstone, and, and Disney. Uh, and then I made my way to ABC Television, where we were uh, producing the Sunday night movies. Um, uh, it used to be um, Walt would come out with a sweater and introduce a movie of the week. It soon became uh, Michael Eisner would come out, and, and we did the, I did that for two years. And then I teamed up with a, um, a fantastic and talented uh, director uh, by the name of John Turtletop. 
and uh, he and I were together for 13 years at Disney <clears throat> um, in movies and television. Uh, and then there was sort of, as we all felt, this seismic shift about 10 years ago where um, it became less about movies and more about television. And that's when I, we, we started producing uh, television. We did three shows together. Um, and four years ago was when Marvel called to say we, we have a slate of uh, shows that we need help getting off the ground. And my first question was, we're not selling anymore? Like these are ready to go? And I was like, they're ready to go. And as a developer, it's sort of your dream come true. Um, and that's where we are today. Really exciting yeah. then. So great journey in. And yeah. so tell me about it. What's I suppose both me to my ears as a director, just we'll come to the development bit later, but it's really interesting how most people go to film school and a lot of people want to be the director yeah. or the writer. And actually yeah. I sometimes think about my time again, would I take that path? Yeah. And I think it's really interesting that you picked up on the development and how exciting that is. What is it about the development that you love so much? Look, I, I think it's 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 the um, what makes a good script. You know, are you reading it for yourself? Are you reading it for audiences? Um, how to communicate to a writer or a producer or a director. I think that's something everybody in this room can relate to. Um, when you find that piece of material and you want to give notes, what's the proper way of going about doing that um, without hurting egos and, and just trying to get the right material out. That interested me, that part interested me. Um, the selling part, again, something we all, we all do. Um, it's tough you know, mm. to, to, to do that. I, I think now it's a great time in television as we all know and there are a lot of shows being made. So. Um, it's competitive. It's a competitive market. So when Marvel did call you, were you like, were you a comic book fan? Were you like, yay, Marvel, this is my dream job? I, I was aware of comic books. I wasn't um, by any means uh, well versed in them, but I think that's what made me appealing to Jeff Loeb, who is our head of television, who made that call. Um, I, I think he was looking for folks who knew how to develop uh, and more importantly knew how to produce. And when you're making Marvel TV shows and we can talk about it uh, further, it's you're not making them for a specific fan base. You, you want to target everyone and we want to bring in new fans to, to Marvel and it all starts with character. So how to find or select those characters you want to uh, develop and make them appealing to a mass audience. So let's just get back a stage because I do want to come to the IP because yep. I think that's going to be something that I want to hear more about and, and I think everyone's going to want to hear about more about. But what I'd like to go back to is the genesis of Marvel TV mm. because interestingly, what I didn't realise until I came to work with you guys that you're actually, even though you're under this umbrella of Disney, you know, ABC Studios yep. and Marvel, you Marvel TV itself is almost like a small startup company and there was really the three of you, Jeff Loeb, yourself, and yeah, Jim Corey. Jim so Corey. tell us about the inception it, and the genesis of It all Marvel started TV. with our head of Marvel, Dan Buckley, and, and Joe Casada, our chief creative officer. And I think they made a, um, a, a concerted effort to get into television. Uh, and Jeff Loeb, who is our head of television, was, was the first one out of the gate to sort of say, if we're going to get into television, here's the game plan. Um, it started with uh, two ABC shows, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and Agent Carter, and both of those properties were spun out of the feature side. Um, and, and I think that just made it appealing as your first jump into television, you want that brand recognition. Um, so the feature side helped us with that. And then it was Jeff who sort of came together and said, um, he put the Defenders package together and said, if, if let's try four individual characters, putting them together in a Defenders, Avengers type situation um, and selling it from there. And, and you know, Dan and Joe, who have been great with us and very supportive, have allowed us to continue developing and selling and, and finding those characters that will appeal to different networks. So was it just, like going back to just the company, it, was it just, how did it start? Like was well, it the it, three it of you in a room it, just Literally, it was, it was uh, Jeff Loeb, Jim Corey, who's our co-head of television and our head of production, and myself, we were uh, in a conference room uh, working out of one of the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. offices uh, four years ago, trying to go, how do we do this? How do we start production on Daredevil, which was the first one out of the gate, and then soon after Jessica followed. Uh, and we shared a conference room for six months, shared a phone, uh, and then we moved to Prospect Studios in Los Angeles, and that's sort of been our home base. Um, but it was a lot of, uh, you know, all credit to Jeff and Jim. I mean, without the two of them, sort of the masterminds of this whole thing, uh, we would not be here. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll talk more probably about Jim and the growth of yeah. the universe, because I think I noticed a seismic change yeah. between, between those. But just going back to the IP, you know, because we've talked about it's great having such brilliant IP, but, you know, you've got Marvel, the umbrella of Marvel, yeah. and then you've got the feature side and you've got the TV side. How did it get divvied up? Who gets what? Well, it's, 
you know, I think uh, what the feature guys did and, and was brilliant. You know, they took Iron Man, they took Hulk, they took Captain America, uh, Thor, and, and gave them each their own movie and then put them together in, in Avengers. That was amazing strategic planning. I think we borrowed from that when it came to the Defenders package. Um, and, and our characters are more street level. We call them our street level superheroes. If the Avengers protect the universe, our characters protect the neighborhood. So there was a certain way of, of having to go about developing for television on a television budget. And the, you know, the, the two common threads for our four defenders are um, uh, single characters, not ensemble, uh, and um, they all shared uh, the neighborhood, Hell's Kitchen, which enabled us to go to, to New York and, and build uh, a home base there for production and get all of that done. So I think you, you just gotta figure out what characters are sort of ripe for television development that you can do right and, and do them a service. Yeah, so, so is it Jeff that chose those in terms of picking up Yeah, I think it, it, it was Jeff and Dan and Joe sort of sat around and said, we can, we can take these characters, let's see what we can do. Um, Daredevil was probably the most known of the four mm -hmm. because of the movie that had come out. Uh, no one knew anything about Jessica. I think there was one comic book uh, alias that had come out on her. Um, so, it, you know, different, we, we, we tried to find the common denominator between the four um, characters yeah. to, to build it around. We should probably talk a bit more about the four, but I think we have a clip of, is it Jessica? Je mm. Do we have Jessica? You know it well, absolutely. Do we have, yeah. okay. A little bit of Jessica Jones. I haven't seen that for so long. Um, I haven't seen that for so yeah. long. Good job. She was cool. She was super cool. I think that's what was exciting for me was, you know, I'm I didn't read comic books, mm -hmm. um, and I'm you know not really in that world as such. Yep. I'm more so now because I've been introduced to it through you guys. And um, but what I loved about Jessica is that she was street level, and I think that's really interesting. But that's a big risk, isn't it? I mean, you took four characters, uh, as you say, Jess Jessica lesser known, some known, mm -hmm. and you know, and you sold it as a package of five. From the off, is that Correct. right? That's so, right. so yeah. how did? So, I'm just trying to find out that inception. If everybody understand this, you know, you got this IP, but somewhere on the line there was this mastermind to go. Let's take these four, and at the end of it, even though they're each in their own show, and I yep. think Jeff said something, which I might just read from Jeff's quote, which is, "The Defenders is the most ambitious television project to date. Period. We set out to do something that had never been done in the history of television. We started and committed to four separate television series, not knowing whether any of them would work." That's pretty big risk taking. No pressure. Yeah. Um, and look, and, and each, <laughs> each episode was, each series was 13 episodes. 13 episodes and then uh, Defenders. And then Defenders. Yeah, which came out last Friday, uh, eight episodes. Um, again, I, I think we, we had great partners in Netflix. Um, a, ABC is our partner in all of this stuff. Because we do it through the studio. We do it through I the think studio. It's, we're more clear here now about that system, but uh, yeah. it, we, we don't quite have that same thing. But you can be Marvel yeah. and then you work with ABC Studios, but you can then go onto other platforms. That's exactly and, right. Yeah. yeah. And, and look, it all starts with the support. If you don't have the support of your network and your fellow partners, you're, you won't get far. Totally. Uh, and they looked at us and, and said, okay, we see, the, we see where you guys want to go with this. Let us help you. Um, and you know there was a there was an, a, a conscious decision to sort of lead with Daredevil, go into Jessica, Luke, Danny Rand, Iron Fist, and we tried to introduce. For example, you 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 were introduced to Luke in Jessica's episode, um, and uh, so there's a, there's a lot of that cross um, thing. But for us, it just starts with character. I, I think if you don't have a character that audiences will relate to, you don't have a show, and you've spent time in those meetings where we, we sat around talking about abilities and what are each individual character's superpowers. There's no superpowers without a character. So attack it from a character, attack it from a, a character standpoint first and then lead into um, abilities and powers. And that is true. I mean, that was my in, because I was like, okay, so she can lift a car. She can throw a car. Who gives a fuck? You know what I mean? Why, why do we care about this woman? Why are we going to spend 13 episodes with That's her? That's exactly right. And there was a lot of meetings about me. There's a lot of meetings, because yeah. what, what is really impressive about you guys is you are incredibly protective of the IP. Very. Uh, but equally, you do allow filmmakers to come in and have a voice. Yes. Uh, it's important for us, and, and one of the things we are most proud of is, on all of our shows, is they all look different, right? Inhumans looks different than Luke, looks different from Jessica, looks different from Cloak and Dagger. We make a concerted effort, uh, and we sit down with our showrunners and our uh, uh, cinematographers and go, how is this one going to look different? Um, we don't want two shows to look alike. Um, you, and, and you empower the showrunner, and it all starts with the writing. You know, if there is, 
if, if you're not writing a character that people are interested in, there's, there's no show. And it's key that they are different as well, isn't it? Because you've attracted different audiences. I mean, we'll stick, yeah. we are going to move off of this, yeah. but we'll stick with the Defenders just because that seems to be the one that exploded yeah. the most. And, and I think you realized what a diverse audience you had. Can you talk a bit we more do. about yeah, that? We do, yeah. I think what we learned, and again, you know, uh, through our partners at Netflix, I think we've learned that each show garners a different demographic. For example, um, males tend to go to Daredevil, females uh, went to Jessica, Luke was sort of a mix. Uh, we had a younger demographic show up for, for Iron Fist. Uh, and then when you put them all together for eight episodes, everyone showed up. And I think that's, that, that's appealing for us. I think we want to target different audiences. We are not making uh, television for just comic book fans. It's, it's got to be appealing for a, a worldwide audience. Absolutely. And, and how did you sustain that growth? Because I came in on <laughs> JJ season yeah. one and you were wrapping up. Uh, and this is, why, this is why I think it's kind of cool to talk about this because, you know, when I said to people I'm going to work with Marvel, they're like, oh my God, it's going to be massive. And I went and it's this little studio out yep. in the arse end of Greenpoint in Brooklyn, yep. Yep. you know, and on Henry Norman Street, yep. I think it is. And, yep. you, and you're down the end of that. And there was this little studio and you had, you were using every inch of the space. But there was also this kind of building next door that stuff was going on. And, you know, Fogwell's gym might have been being filmed in right. there. And Jessica was setting up and Daredevil was wrapping up. Mm -hmm. And it felt like this kind of small contained production. <clears throat> when I came back for Defenders, it was like I'd stepped into this whole studio. It was studio. a city. Yeah, it was a city. city. Yeah. It was a Marvel city yeah. of suddenly we had, I think you had Iron Fist wrapping up, The Punisher yeah. was filming, yeah. uh, and there was something else was in prep, and then you had Defenders, which we were kicking off. That growth, and I think that's part why I think we should probably bring up Jim again, isn't yes. it? Because he is a mastermind he, of he is production. The, the, he is the sole reason we were able to do what, what, what we did. And with the support of uh, our friends at ABC, we sort of built an infrastructure. And we knew we were going to be in New York. Did you actually build studios? Um, we built stages. Stages. We built stages. Yeah. Um, we, you know, we knew that um, these shows were very stunt heavy. Uh, so we built an area where the stunt team can rehearse and, and shoot pre -vis. Um, we knew what was necessary to sort of tackle these shows. Jim Corey was the first one to come in and go, if you're going to do it, here's the roadmap. Yeah. Uh, and it started with uh, Daredevil was the first one. Then we wrapped that, moved the crew over to Jessica, uh, and then moved it to Luke. And then at that point, Daredevil was renewed. And then we had two shows going at the same time. And we were like, how do we do this? Um, and now we're new on. New teams came on. New teams came on. Um, and now we're doing two shows simultaneously. Uh, and soon to be three shows simultaneously. So it, it's a massive undertaking, but Jim Corey was the first guy to sit us down and go, here's the road. He now. is the master, isn't he? Because he He's looks not. at, he can look at a schedule and he can look at all yep. these shows and somehow in his brain managed to go, well, you can't have this character at this time he, and this character here and they've got to be here. And it's just extraordinary. I mean, it's mind boggles me when I was there, just how big it was becoming. He is first and foremost a producer, um, Jeff Loeb, writer. I, I think that's what Marvel yeah. brings to the table. I, I don't think we are and traditional. And you producer. And I came from a producing yeah. background. Yeah. I don't think we are a traditional studio in the sense of e executives. I, none of us went through the ranks of a studio or a network, um, but we are very hands-on and we have that producing experience um, and background to help us with it. Now, since then, we've hired an amazing team. I, I know you've seen the growth in that. Uh, our development team is amazing, and we've brought on a lot of great people as, as we start building it out. We have Tom further. Lieber now. We, Tom. we love Tom. Yes. To Tom's, a, Tom's like a mini you, isn't yes. he? If you can't get through to Karim, you go to He'll Tom. He'll love that. Yeah. He'll love that. <laughs> but no, he, he's great. The, team, the team's fantastic, but I think in many ways it comes still back to that it's still quite small at its core, isn't it? Yes. Um, it, it just, it's, it's being able to maintain the hands-on, Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, being in daily contact with your showrunners. We have a presence on set. There's always a, a Marvel executive or two that is with the production and and we're there to just help keep the trains moving and anytime a, a question regarding Marvel IP comes up someone is there for that and and that is very useful I know I had Sam Thomas on yes. uh, Jessica yep. Jones and she yep. was amazing I was able to go can Jessica do this yeah. I want to do this and then there'd be a conversation and there's more of that and I think we're, we're building that team from within yeah uh, Samantha's been with us from day one and, and Tom Lieber joined us Mark Ambrose Grant Gage. I mean there's a there's a whole yeah, slew whole, of, of whole folks that now. are coming in Exciting. Yeah, it is. What's really exciting, which I would really like to move on to talk about now, is yep. IMAX. Go, oh, yeah. You know, I Good. think it's, uh, should we? I that you, small show? That small show, yeah. uh, which is, so just describe to me just a little bit, and then I think we'll show the trailer for it Great. and then talk a little bit more about it. But just tell us just <clears throat> what Inhumans is in Yeah, it was, it was, um, Inhumans is, uh, is a Marvel series. Uh, it's Marvel's first family show. And, and 
um, <coughs> if family meaning the characters are related. We, we have never done that. And that was exciting for us to, um, to delve into. Uh, we had an amazing opportunity to partner with ABC and IMAX and put together this um, unprecedented event, which is we shot the first two episodes uh, with IMAX cameras and equipment in Hawaii. Uh, and that'll air in IMAX theaters for two weeks, starting uh, September 1. And then uh, we, we broke them off into individual and in, in eight episode order, which will air on, on ABC. So it was a way for us to sort of attract a wider audience and be the first to sort of debut a television series in IMAX theaters, which um, hasn't been done and we're very proud of. Very well, let's of have a look at it then. Yeah. Okay, we let's have a look at Inhumans. Um, it, a lot of planning went into that one, and um, you know, I, the first two episodes have over 600 visual effects shots in it. I mean, that, that's how massive that this whole undertaking that's is. That's huge. It, it's huge, and, and it wasn't until a week ago where we finally finished everything. So it's been a, a, a work in progress and um, on a feature film scale. Well, it is, isn't it? I mean, I think that's what's exciting yeah. as a filmmaker, and the lines are blurring. They've been blurring for a while, but never more so than now, is it? I mean, the fact that ABC have a show that is going out on the network, yeah. but that is premiering on yeah. IMAX cinema. Again, it, it goes back to partners. And I think uh, without their support, without IMAX support, I, I don't think we're able to pull this off and, and do that. And I think they believed in the project and they believed in our vision for it. Um, it's a big IP on the publishing side that um, we wanted to do right by. So it just took some time to sort of formulate the game plan, get those eight scripts written out and produce it the right way. So tell us a bit more about the Inhumans themselves. Yeah. So what about those, who are those characters and why that story now? We, we call them, uh, it's our version of Marvel's royal family. Um, and uh, Black Bolt is the king, his brother Maximus, uh, and there's sort of a difference of opinion happening between the two. They, they live on the dark side of the moon, a place called Adelan, uh, and uh, Maximus wants to move um, the humans to Earth, and, and um, there's a sort of battle of wits between the two, and um, to, a pl to a place where Maximus tries to overthrow his brother. Um, and uh, Black Bolt and his family move to Earth, where we shot in Hawaii, and we play Hawaii for Hawaii, uh, and it becomes sort of a manhunt for, for them, and, and how do they get back to Adelan to overthrow Maximus? So there's some great character plot points in there, which is vital for the show. Um, and then the, the visual effects, which you saw a little bit of there. Yeah, you got, the, so that's a dog, right? <laughs> the, ti the, ti the time travels, is that right? Yes. I mean. He's great. He steals the show. I bet he does. <laughs> I bet he does. It looks amazing. Yeah. But you can see even that alone, there must be layers upon layers upon layers. Yeah, just effects. that alone, you know, took months of, of, you know, research and development and how to get it right and to, to do it properly to, to make them look that way. Yeah, and it feels big budget. It, it was. It yeah. was. Again, that was... <laughs> You know, that was, uh, um, to, to, you hear IMAX cameras, you see the IMAX equipment, and you know you have to sort of raise the game yeah. a little bit. Um, but again, that was Jim and Jeff sort of planning it out and mapping it out for us. And we, we thought that Hawaii would be the best place to, to shoot that. I think it gives you um, forest, jungle, city, which all of our uh, inhumans sort of land in different parts of that. World. And when they get to Earth, do they, do they know others are down there or is it? They do, yeah, there, there are in humans and we sort of touch upon it, if, if there are any Marvel fans, um, we, we touch upon it in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., um, the Inhumans, and, and this is just sort of taking it one step further. That is exciting, isn't it? The cross-pollination, yeah. that I always call it, of the Marvel Universe. Yeah, it's subtle. It's subtle. I, I don't think you, you don't ever want to make an audience feel that because they missed a show, they're not going to be able to, to catch this one. It's just subtle hints along the way, and then when you come into these first two episodes, you're, you're in. You're, you're sort of caught up on where everything is. But if you watch all of them, if you have seen all of the 14 mm. series, mm -hmm. there are what you call Easter eggs. There are Easter eggs, absolutely. So um, just talk to us about the Easter eggs and what I they are. I can't give you Easter eggs. No, no, I'm not saying, I know you're not going to give us to them, but describe, it's just like you dot them in as many as you can, isn't it? Like, for example, in JJ, we had from the books, which were absolutely brilliant, I thought, we had the Egon Sheila picture, yeah. right, that we then put in yeah. Jessica's room, I think yeah. it was, even yeah. though I think it was in Luke's in the books. Mm -hmm. I know I got counted on mm -hmm. that somewhere. Mm -hmm. But you just try and take those little bits from the comic books. Look, they're, they're as subtle as that. They're as flagrant as, you, you know, if you look at Defenders and even some of the new shows that we're doing, we always try to put a, a poster or a picture of Stan Lee uh, somewhere. It's uh, usually a, a missing person in a police station. 
isn't he? Or like, yeah, yeah. wanted. Wanted. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's a new one. Uh, there's a new one that we're doing on one of our shows. That's uh, uh, he, he's a guy who won a big settlement. You know, so he's like, <laughs> it, it just subtle. You know, you yeah, just yeah, want to yeah. see his mug and go, oh, there he is, and, and it, it goes by fast. But those are the those are the Easter eggs. Um, now you have another clip from Inhumans, don't you? Yeah, this is something we're very proud of. I think this will give you guys a sense of um, uh, the, the action and the music uh, that went into this. We, we made a very concerted effort. You guys will recognize the song um, to sort of um, find songs and that, that have been sort of remade. Um, so this is something that um, very retro. You guys, you guys will see it, but we're very proud of the sequence and it'll speak to uh, the character uh, Karnak. Karnak. And who is Karnak? You'll watch, you'll see. All right. <laughs> Show us Karnak. Then you'll ask your question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Very cool. And that's in the first episode. That's in the first episode. I mean, that is going to be very cool in the yeah, IMAX, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. That's very exciting. And have you seen it in the IMAX yet? We have. It's, it's great. Oh, wow. How was that for everybody? It was different. It's, um, the, the IMAX experience, you know, we didn't know much about it. And then when you sort of uh, sit down with IMAX and, and they sort of tell you the the Jason Bourne stuff, the handheld, doesn't work on IMAX because right. the audiences just start going, whoa, um, especially on 70. Um, so it, it sort of moved the camera this way, sort of in and out. I think it gives you depth for, um, for what Yeah, you don't have any whip pans or anything in there, do you? Yeah. yeah. It'll drive everybody crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, it was interesting. It was, a great, um, it was a great lesson to learn about IMAX and, and how, they, how they do their business. So IMAX, but you also work with a lot of other platforms as well, don't you? And you're branching out even more. I mean, we've obviously talked about Defenders have been with Netflix. Yeah. You've got stuff on ABC. Yeah. But you've now got Freeform, which is the new it used, ABC, a, ABC Family. used to be ABC Family, now Freeform. Hulu. Hulu. Is that right? And yep. the others are... Uh, I'm putting you well, on the spot now, right? A, a, FX, uh, Fo FX is Legion. Fox is The Gifted. Um, Hulu is Runaways. Uh, we have two with Freeform. Um, Cloak and Dagger and New Warriors. Um, Netflix. I think I've hit them all. Yeah, I think so. And if not, someone will yell at someone me. Someone will yell, exactly. But, you're, but uh, what's interesting is, let's move on to like Cloak and Dagger and, yep. and Runaways, yep. because those are more, I think I'm allowed to say, they're skewed to a younger audience. Y y yes, and, yes and yes no. And, no. And, and, and look, I, th I think that what happened there was, as we start selling to more networks, you want to, um, you want to find a different tone to sell to them. You, you never want to make a network feel like they're getting a version of another show. Gotcha. So uh, I think with Hulu and Freeform, we were able to, to find two properties, Cloak and Dagger and, and Runaways, that appeal to, yes, a younger demographic, but we treat it um, a little more upscale, a little more mature. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's sort of where audiences are going now in television. Um, you don't want to, um, I hate the phrase, dumb it down. You want to mature it up because I think they're just, audiences are smarter now. They're becoming incredibly sophisticated. Absolutely. And, yeah. and I think... Cloak and Dagger is a show we're very proud of. Um, Tell us a little bit about it then. What is Cloak, so Cloak and Dagger? Cloak and Dagger, the, the quick 30 second of it all is it's, it's um, two young kids. They were seven or eight years old at the time, were part of a horrific accident. Uh, they don't remember. Um, whatever happened during that accident garnered them their superpowers. But it's superpowers that they will not know until they meet up again when they're 17, 18, 10 years later. And that's when they do. They sort of have this this weird connect, they see each other again, they don't recognize each other, and when they touch, the superpowers um, sort of come into play. Um, we shot that in New Orleans, uh, we're shooting the series now in New Orleans, which is a character in itself, uh, that town. Um, and we're very proud of that show. And Joe Pekaski is our Joe showrunner. Joe Pekaski. Who you know. You Joe Pekaski I know, just as a really random aside, yep. but Joe Pekaski happened to be the writer of my very first episode of television US drama on Heroes, yeah. which is sort of how it all, because it's full circle. It's quite familial, isn't it, in terms of... He is, yeah. Uh, Joe you know, was almost part of that Heroes. Yes. Of, and, the and young and writer coming up through the Heroes exactly system right. with Jeff and Jim. That's right. At the time. Yep. And, and Joe was on staff uh, for Daredevil season one. Uh, and then right in the middle of that season, Underground was picked up. So he had to leave us to, to go produce that. Which he did with Misha Green, I think, didn't he? That's yes. exactly yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. And um, he, he ran that show for two seasons and then sort of found his way back to us. And, and this property means a lot to him. Um, and, and I think that's passion from the showrunner means everything. I don't think you need to be a Marvel fan to understand character or what we want to do. Um, and our motto is different is good. You know, mm. it's okay to sort of set it apart from the others and try things. I think that, that's what we like doing. 
Cool. Well, not to overload with clips, but I'm... Yeah, you, you want to see it? Yeah, yeah, can we see Have yeah, we got a great. cloak and dagger? We do, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. Fans of cloak and dagger out there, which is awesome. Can you guess which one's cloak and which one's dagger? <laughs> Let, tell us. Uh, <laughs> Watch the show. That looks super cool. It's great. Really it's, good. It's, yeah. And who directed that? Gina Prince Bythewood directed the first one. Um, brilliant director. And she came in. It's funny, you know, we were in the wooing stages of, come on, Gina, come do this. And, you know, everybody's chasing her. And, and she has uh, uh, twin boys who are fans of this. And they were like, Mom, you have to do this. That's how we got it. <laughs> that's lucky. Sometimes yeah, that's exactly. what you do, right? It helps. It helps. Exactly. So, exactly. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting because, you know, for me, there's a lot of characters I don't know about. And mm. I was and I when I came into the universe, uh, the Marvel world, and I was like, oh, yeah, we're doing the Defenders. These are like big characters. And, yeah. and then it was uh, we were we were wrapping up Defenders and I was actually editing the cut in Los Angeles. It was coming up towards Christmas. Secret Santa was going on in post-production, as you do. And the post-production office is pretty long. And the reason I tell you this bit of information is Jesse, my assistant editor, got a gift. I think it was Jesse that got it or he gave it for somebody else, which was a Marvel kind of like poster calendar type thing, mm -hmm. concertina poster that opened up <laughs> with all the Marvel characters. <laughs> and he literally put it one into the office and it <laughs> opened and it opened and it opened and it continued to open and it continued to open and it literally went all the way down. And I was like, fuck yeah. me. <laughs> I thought we'd already like yeah. seen a lot of them. And they put post-its on all the ones that yeah. we'd done, which was this little piss in the ocean, sort of down <laughs> at that end. And I was like, oh, wow. I mean, there are thousands of characters, yes. yeah. aren't there? Yeah, there are. Um, we, I know there are people that go, oh my God, you're so lucky. Y yes, yes and no. I, I think there's, um, with that amount of characters, you don't want to oversaturate the market. I think you also want to uh, do a service to each of those characters. And, and there is a right way to, to tell those stories. And it, it's rare to find the, the right combination of a showrunner, an, an IP that is available to us, and a network that will support it. So once those three things align, you've, you've got a show. Um, the, the interesting thing that I've learned being at Marvel is there are various um, stories of each comic, right? So Daredevil, there are different, different stories about each one. Sure. I think what we like to do with a showrunner, showrunner is when he or she starts with us is try to sort of kick them off on the right path. Like let's focus on telling this story of, of Daredevil or this story of Cloak and Dagger because there are so many out there. Um, and look, it, so far it's been, it's been good for us. Um, we have a job to do which is to keep ideas fresh and characters fresh and, um, and do right by them. Which, which is the good and the bad. It, it's hard, you know, it's, it's hard keeping everything unique and different. And is that the secret of the success, do you think, in many ways? I mean, who knows what that is? It's hard to bottle, but I'm sure, you know, and as we said at the very beginning, you've got this extraordinary IP, but it doesn't yeah. always make great TV. Sure. But is it about, is that where you guys come into it, where you really try and carefully fit? Like I was clearly a good fit for JJ, yeah. whereas I'm probably not a good fit for some other things because you find you're in and you do allow that creative dialogue to happen. I mean, we fought a lot. Yes. And, and it seems that you're open to that. I mean, in a good way. And when we, I say fine, we, it isn't like, you're it. fucking I, shit, listen. you're fucking rubbish. It's like, it's like you come at each other and you're pushing I, the IP. I'm pushing it, you're pulling absolutely. it. We're Look, all making it. I think you got to be a part of watching. You, you had a handful of producers with you. I, and you were able to push back and go, I think she should do this. And there are times where we fought you, but we were open to a lot of things. Um, one thing Jeff likes to tell our showrunners is, when you come work for Marvel, you're, you sort of have this... 10 lane highway, okay? Feel free to tell the story you want. If you're hitting the guardrails and you want to try something that we know won't work, we'll shove you back in. Yeah. But um, you, you have this world and, and it all starts with a story. And character. Know? And character, that, that's it. And, and, yeah. and, and if there's that right fit of, of showrunner and, and property, It'll, it'll do well. And this is your arena, basically, isn't it? You go, this is your arena, go play. Yeah. You know. Yeah, but there are new, there are new arenas we want to try. I think comedy for us um, is, is an area we want to go into. Um, we saw the success of Guardians of the Galaxy. Brilliant. And, and how this genre can work yeah. on the comedy side. Uh, it took us time to, to dip our foot into the comedy pool because we wanted to get it right. I, mean, I think there's something that makes a Marvel comedy special. Like You don't want it to feel... Like you, Marvel's never going to do an office comedy. You don't need Marvel to, to do that. I think we need that sort of right story, that right 
backdrop and the right characters to, to be able to do something different in, in comedy. And, and adult animation is, is also another arena we want to get into. So it's, uh, the bubble might not burst just yet, even though people say it might. <laughs> yeah, I don't, look, I keep the characters fresh. I, I think people just want to hear a good story, no, no matter who's at the heart of it and what superpower is at the end of it. If it's a great character who has a great storyline, I think people will watch. Brilliant. I hope people will watch. Yeah. Um, well, we've waffled on a lot. We should probably open it up and see if okay. there's some questions out yeah. there, I think. There's a hand being raised over there, sir. Cameron, hand over his mic. Hi, you talked about the uh, location being a character as well. Have you got any plans to shoot future projects in the UK, and in particular Manchester, where I'm based? <laughs> no pressure. The silence speaks for you. You're not allowed to No, look, I, I, we'd, we'd love to. We'd love to. I, I, um, if it's I, the right character the and the right story, they'll we'd be there. We're, we're absolutely open to it. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, gentleman at the back, I think. <clears throat> Hello. Um, it's more of an appeal, really, I suppose. Um, I appreciate that you know, the large universe, you, you put in Easter eggs because you don't want people to think they have to watch all 14 shows to get involved. But is there a bit of a div slow divorce happening between the movie universe and the TV universe? And I think some, there's an element of the fan base that's picking up on that. Yeah, I, I don't think it's, it's divorce. I think it's, um, you know, like, like the television side, they've mapped out their world for, you know, X amount of years. Um, I think for us to try to keep up with that and, and match it on the TV side just becomes overwhelming. So they have their characters, they've mapped out their stories on where they're going, and so have we. I, it's rare that things will intersect. I, I think we just like to keep them separate, only it just, it's easier. It's but, easier but it for is us. the things that the, the fans live for and possibly part of the explosion of the comic book success that these stories are linked. Something yeah. will affect or pay off They're definitely somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, in Luke Cage specifically, there's a scene where there, there's a young kid who's sort of, hand, he's selling DVDs of uh, what happened in Avengers. He's like, who wants to see the destruction? Like that sort of, those, those are the Easter eggs we like to lay. We recognize what happened in Avengers. Our characters know that but we just treat it as our characters were 10 blocks away dealing with Hell's Kitchen. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, lady here. Um, I was just wondering if you could talk a little about Legion. Um, because I was so excited when that mod came out and I knew that it was like, that yeah. You know, it, it, as you know, came out of the X-Men franchise. So and this is Legion, if you didn't hear yeah, it. Yeah, and, and, and Noah Hawley came in and it just phenomenal take on it. and visually stunning that first season. Um, and they're, they're close to starting production uh, on season two. I think they're a week or two away. Um, but we were thrilled to be a part of that. Yeah. Yes. Hello, I'm Julie Quake from the film office for 5 Tay side. A cheeky question. Couldn't send some superheroes to play golf at St. Andrews, could you? <laughs> could you send some superheroes to play golf at St. Andrews? <laughs> <laughs> the golf course. <laughs> Crim's like, what, what? I know. Uh, we can. You, I, yeah, <laughs> probably in a different universe, yes. maybe. <laughs> yeah, I think there was a hand at the back at one point, or in the middle, sir, yeah. Pass the mic down. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you approach character development. In particular, do you use like Laurie Hutzler's emotional toolbox or anything like that? Um, look, I, I wish. I, I think um, our secret weapon in all this is, is Jeff Loeb. You know, Jeff Loeb is a storyteller, as you know. Yeah. Um, and I, I think when showrunners come in to sort of pitch us. The first initial meeting is just character. Like, tell us what you want to do with Luke Cage. Tell us why Luke Cage inspired you. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. Che O'Coker, when, when he came in to talk to us about Luke Cage, um, said, you know, I grew up with no heroes. You know, my, my dad wasn't around. And um, I opened the Luke Cage comic book, and he became my hero. You know, and, and his grandfather, sort of, he, he told an amazing story of how his grandfather tied into to what Luke Cage meant to him. And we went... You got it. Like that's that's exactly right, and and that's that's the story of season one. 
you know, of, of Luke is what, it, what does it take to be a hero and, and how do you deal with that? So um, because we have 14 shows now, I think everyone needs to be well versed in the characters that we've explored and come in with a, here's something you guys haven't tackled yet. Here's a story you guys haven't tackled yet. Uh, and then we'll go off and, and do it. And Jeff is good at policing that though, isn't he? I mean, I, I, on yeah. many occasions we've gone in and said, hey, we've got this great idea for a sequence. Yep. And you know, you'll pitch it and you'll be pitching your ass off and you'll sell it and the visuals and everything else. And you'll go, but why do I care? And he could be that blunt, and, but that's brilliant actually, because he really is. And he'll come up, this is what I think it needs to be about. Exactly and he doesn't right. tell you how to do it, but he'll go, I think this is what this needs to be about yeah. for me. Yeah. And he keeps that, because I guess there is a policing in some ways that has to be done with the IP, because you have super, super loyal fans. And I mean, it's terrifying as yep. a creator coming in on a show where you know the fans probably know more about them than you do, yeah. as much as you turn up. Yeah. And you're yeah. like, oh my God, if I get this wrong, people are gonna be so angry. I, look, I, I think it works both ways. I think we have a very loyal fan base and without that fan base, we wouldn't be here talking right now. Uh, but I think that fan base um, has shown, <gasps> they're, they're eager to sort of see a new story come out of those characters. I think they're the first ones to go, oh, I didn't think you guys, that's cool. That's a cool twist on, on that character. So it works both ways. I think they understand that um, we will not always stay true to the IP. We want to play around and, and try some things. Um, I think, you know, Inhumans and Cloak and Dagger and, and Runaways are perfect examples of that. When those shows come out, I think you'll see some of the, um, uh, the, the chances we took with, with story. But yeah, you can't always follow what um, the original IP. I think no, but they do see they're pretty loyal, aren't they? Very, I mean, very, you know, I've had experience very. at Comic Con, and you yeah. go and you have another, you do another show, you know, and it premieres, and you're like, where's my Comic Con? Where's the Marvel crowd? Because yeah. they are so they are so passionate, and they yeah. really they camp yeah. out to be there for these sort of I, events. I, I've seen, um, you know, I, younger audiences now. Um, and I've seen it in 12 to 13, 14 year old girls sort of making their way into comics. Uh, Wonder Woman has helped that. Jessica Jones, I think, helped that a lot. And it's, there's a reason why people go to comics. It's either an escape mechanism or a creative outlet or something's going on at home or at school that they're just not connecting and they sort of escape to these and they connect with these characters. Um, and that's important to us and I think we want to stay true to that because at the end of the day, it is, it's, it's the ultimate underdog story. It's, it's the, the folks that don't fit in or just aren't comfortable in their own skin um, and how they, they turn that around. And I think at our core, that's probably everybody in some way, isn't that, it? That's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, you can, all, you can always connect to that. There's always some way to connect to it. Um, we've probably got time for one more question, if there is out there. Yes, lady in the front. Come charging down the stairs yeah. with the microphone. Hi, um, I thought Jessica Jones was such a revelation in terms of a strong female protagonist in this sort of genre. And I was wondering, you hoping to do, and for me, I, as a female audience, I thought it was fantastic in having that. And I feel it's such a male dominated genre. Are you planning on doing more female skewed shows going yeah, forward? For sure. Um, uh, there's something we have in development now with, with ABC that um, I'm really excited about. Um, obviously, I can't. <laughs> But uh, it, it, is, it is Jessica Jones-esque, um, and, and I think that's our version of, of bringing that to ABC and that audience, and uh, I'm very, very excited about that one, and I think if we get it right, it'll be able to, um, it'll be able to do something good. Don't look at me when you say that. <laughs> she gave you the Jessica compliment, I'm like, here. Uh, well, Jessica, yeah, I mean, I think I felt that when I read the Jessica script, I didn't think that was my world, and when I read it, I was actually blown away by the fact that there was a superhero that I could relate to. She drank, she swears, yeah. you know, what's not to like? I mean... I, I, I think that's why it worked. It was, yeah. You hadn't seen that character before. Deeply flawed, yeah. vulnerable, you know, abrasive, sarcastic. It was like reading a book about myself. <laughs> uh, you know, it was... Uh, but I do think that is... Fun. That was what I found revelatory and very exciting. I think it's why I returned to it. So, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish with one question. I mean, we've already talked about will the bubble burst and how many characters there are. And you probably can't tell us, but is there a secret in tray because I am I am so intrigued by these thousands of characters do you have a little secret in tray that's got a list of names that are sort of next on the list that or, or that you guys the triumvirate that is sort of Marvel TV we do yeah we do um, and I and I think we've um, just to go a step ahead I think we've we've sort of Jeff has circled sort of what characters we want to get into adult animation with what characters we want to focus on comedy and and what's the next wave of Marvel one hour 
Um, and, and I think the, the secret there is to do a genre, to do a tone that we haven't done before, you know, so. To change the game yet again. Uh, okay. <laughs> Well, brilliant. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Thank you. Thank Game you. changer, Karim Zrick. <laughs> Thank you.